episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Today we are honored to be joined by none other than uh, Dr. Leonard Hayflick, uh, Professor of Anatomy, University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, where he has been part of the faculty since 1988. Uh, Dr. Hayflick received his PhD at, here in Philadelphia at Penn, uh, did his postdoctoral work at University of Texas uh, under the tutelage of the renowned cell culturist uh, Professor Charles Pombrat, and then he returned to Philly, uh, where he spent 10 years as an associate member of the Worcester Institute uh, and two years as assistant professor of research medicine at Penn. Uh, Dr. Hayflick is extremely well known in our life sciences world for a wide range of research, including the domains of cell biology, uh, viral vaccine development, mycoplasmology. Uh, in 1962, he discovered that contrary to what was believed since the turn of the century, that cultured normal cells and human and animal have limited capacity to replicate. Uh, this phenomenon ultimately became known as the Hayflick limit, uh, which became a discovery that overturned uh, dogma that existed since the beginning of the 20th century and really focused the attention of the cell as this fundamental location of age-related changes. Uh, Dr. Hayflick is a member of numerous national and international scientific and public boards of directors and committees. He is now or has been on the editorial boards of more than 10 professional journals, including editor-in-chief of Experimental Gerontology. Uh, he's a member of 20 scientific and professional societies in which he has held high offices, including president of the Gerontological Society of America, founding member of the Council of the National Institute on Aging, NIH at the NIH and Chairman of Executive Committee, uh, consultant to the National Cancer Institute, uh, to the World Health Organization, uh, and member of several scientific advisory boards. Uh, he was also the chairman of the Scientific Review Board of the American Federation for Aging Research, where he's also a vice president and member of its board of directors. Uh, he is the author of the very popular book, How and Why We Age, uh, and also uh, during his career as consultant uh, at Genentech uh, from early on in its inception for a few decades after that, where uh, one component of his amazing uh, research, namely that for uh, cell culture and growing uh, animal cells and fermentation tanks for large-scale production of biologics, uh, was responsible for Genentech's billion-dollar blockbuster biologics throughout the decades. Uh, a lot to talk about. Dr. Hayflick, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. You're welcome. Nice to see you. It's good seeing you. Um, you know, typically, we start the show off uh, by giving our guests the floor to, to talk a little bit about themselves. Um, I, you know, I was hoping I could ask you to start off with like two places. One, if you could uh, sort of take us back to uh, sort of Depression era Philadelphia, uh, where you're growing up, and sort of how you developed this original interest in science, in biomedicine. And also, if you could take us to sort of mid-century, mid-20th century uh, Philly, um, back to sort of that Worcester, Penn biomedical ecosystem where we had Len Hayflick, Hilary Kaprowski, Stan Plotkin. Uh, I don't know if Jonas Salk ever stopped by to say hi, but if you could take us back to what things were like back in those days as well, like you've got to make a really, really great introduction to, uh, to who you are. Well, my uh, early interest in interest in science, I think, was triggered by a gift made to me when I was about, I think, eight or nine years old by an uncle who gave me, uh, I guess for my birthday, a Gilbert chemistry set. Some of those folks who are uh, uh, in my uh, age cohort will remember Gilbert chemistry sets. And it contained, as the name indicates, a bunch of chemicals, small amounts, with an instruction book on how to do so-called experiments. And um, that triggered my interest in chemistry uh, that, main, that was maintained for quite some time, during which uh, time I built a chemistry lab in the basement of my home in West Philadelphia on, um, let's see, where was it? It must have been on uh, Florence Avenue. And uh, I don't think it was Warrington, which preceded that, but it was on Florence Avenue in Southwest Philly. And um, my mother was 
very liberal as my father was in respect to what they allowed me to do. So there was no difficulty in constructing this lab with shelves containing lots of chemicals. And I uh, obtained even more chemicals in later years from various sources, pharmacies, etc. And did the usual kinds of experiments that you would expect a young kid to do, made explosives and flares <laughs> and uh, stuff like that, annoyed the neighbors uh, significantly. Uh, and he, uh, but I learned a heck of a lot of chemistry on my own with, with that as the source. And uh, I even, even got to the point of annoying my high school chemistry teacher, who I had the chutzpah to correct on one or two occasions. And he was so uh, impressed, first of all, with my knowledge, and secondly, that I ha would have the guts to criticize him in front of the class that he banished me to the laboratory stockroom, which was a big mistake because there were lots of chemicals there that I didn't have. And so I admit to the theft of tiny amounts of uh, half a dozen or so of the chemicals that I didn't have and learned more about those uh, half a dozen. Uh, and uh, spent the um, course time in the stock room. And uh, that was luck. that was fortunate. The chemistry teacher was, was actually very good. I respected him a great deal. And I also had some very good physics. Uh, I had a very good physics teacher at Bartram High School where I attended for my high school years. And then um, uh, I, had, I had very good marks in high school, and I, I won a scholarship to Temple University, which was fairly significant. But I turned it down because I had this impression, rightly or wrongly, that Penn was better. I'm not sure about that, but at least I thought in the sciences they might uh, be able to, uh, I might be better off at Penn. And so I enrolled at Penn and uh, that was in uh, January uh, of 1946. A strange time to begin Penn, at Penn, but things were changed around because it was the end of the Second World War and at least active and legal end didn't occur until later. Uh, I uh, it turned out that my parents were unable to pay the $350 per semester tuition. Um, they, we were ju just recovering from the depression, of course. And uh, as a consequence of that, I took advantage of the then 18 month enlistment possibility in the U.S. Army to get uh, the GI Bill of Rights, which was a huge thing because it would pay in full for, for four years at Penn. So I took leave of absence, joined the Army uh, uh, technically five days before it officially ended on May 15th, 1946. And spent 18 months in the Army, got the GI Bill, Attended Penn, majored in chemistry and uh, microbiology, and then um, decided uh, to accept a position that my professor of microbiology had found for me at uh, what was called uh, Sharp and Dome at the time, mm. outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I forget the name of the community now. But I knew that th that when I was hired by them, that that Sharpendom entity would be merged with Merck, and my labs would move to West Point, Pennsylvania, north of Philadelphia. So I uh, joined that that unit, and I when we went got to West Point. 
Pennsylvania. I commuted with a fellow who also lived near by me in southwest Philly. Incidentally, I did not, uh, I, I was unable for financial reasons to live in the dorms of Penn, so I commuted to Penn by trolley car from West Philadelphia where, where I lived. Uh, so I really didn't have a the kind of college experience or university experience that most people have. Uh, in any case, to get back to um, my years, year or two at uh, Merck and West Point, um, where actually where I met my wife, uh, actually, and uh, after experiencing interactions with the PhDs there at Sharp and Dome, and I thought I was unable uh, to reach that level of education. I then realized after interacting with many of these um, senior scientists there, since I was in the research lab as a technician, um, I realized that I might have the ability to get a higher degree so I enrolled, I uh, applied to Penn, Penn's Department of Medical Microbi Microbiology in the medical school, um, and I was accepted and uh, was very interested in a obscure group of microorganisms then and even to this day. At that time, they were called pleuronomonia-like organisms, and the name changed. Today they're known as mycoplasmas. They're the smallest free living microorganisms. You, you uh, cannot see them with ordinary with an ordinary light microscope individually. You, you can see their colonies on agar, however. And I became fascinated with that group of organisms. Uh, ultimately got a master's degree that I served at at the Wistar Institute Animal Laboratory, the famous Wistar rat colony, famous because it was there in the early part of the 1900s that a woman scientist uh, actually invented or, uh, or grew the first um, albino white rats that served as the origin of all of the white rats used in experimental laboratories throughout the world. They were thought to be inbred, which was one of their major advantages. However, later on when the Institute was taken over by Hilary Kaprowski, he brought along with him, um, I'm blocking on his name now, a fellow who test, it was an expert in, um, in the genetics of inbreeding, and he discovered that in fact they were not inbred, which was a disaster uh, for many people. But to get back to my role, I uh, got my master's degree in the Wistar rat colony, where I isolated for the first time in the field um, mycoplasmas, Prior to that, only laboratory strains existed in, in, at Penn, which had a, a uh, large number of people in the microbiology department studying these organisms. And I went on to get my PhD uh, under rather unusual circumstances, some funny anecdotes that might be of interest, and that is that um, the medical school at that time, of course, was part of the original medical school building built um, in the late 1800s. And I had a very primitive lab along with a, another graduate student who worked with me. And we were, uh, I was planning to continue my work with, with the mycoplasmas, but my, uh, my mentor who was an assistant uh, professor and didn't technically have the capacity to have graduate students, although that was permitted uh, by circumventing the rules and having my, uh, my other student in the lab with me, officially uh, the students of Stuart Mudd, 
who was chairman of the Department of Medical Microbiology at that time, a wonderful man with lots of interesting stories about him that I won't go into, but he was just a wonderful, wonderful liberal guy uh, who suffered enormously because his, either his father or his grandfather was the Dr. Mudd who treated the um, uh, John, John Wilkes Booth. Mm. And that blemish, uh, he had to suffer for, for years, at least people who knew the story. So um, getting back to the mo a more significant uh, point in my career was that uh, Warren Steinbring, which, which is the name of my assistant professor, mentor, a practical mentor, he, had, he just returned from the first cell culture course given in this country in New York State at a small hospital in upper New York State. And he came back from that course full of enthusiasm about culturing animal and human cells in vitro and bottles and flasks. And he... Um, he uh, persuaded me to become interested in that area as well. I was reluctant, but because he was my boss, uh, I decided to compromise and I said, okay, I'll do a PhD dissertation with the mycoplasmas uh, in tissue culture to see what, how their behavior is in tissue culture. He agreed, and that got me started in the field of cell culture. This was in 19, mm, I should think of the year now, it must have been 53, 52, something in that region. And uh, that got me interested in cell culture that remained with me pretty much for my entire career. Uh, he then was, uh, Dr. Steinbring was then able to get me a uh, postdoc in the laboratory of Charlie Pomerat at the University of Texas in Galveston, which was a huge event because uh, Pomerat was a world leading authority on cell culture, from whom I learned quite a bit. Uh, and it was from there that I moved to the Wistar Institute in 1958 after my uh, fellowship at, at the University of Texas ended. And uh, I learned from one of my former professors to whom I wrote for information on, on permanent positions. And that person was Werner Henley a very well-known virologist, he and his wife, Gertie, Gertrude Henley. And Warner wrote back and said that a man by the name of Hillary Kaprowski was taking over the Wistar Institute, which, which was in decline for many, many years. Although sad to say, even to this day, the Wistar leadership does not recognize one of the key events that occurred there uh, at about the time that I, uh, was there as a, as a master's degree student in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the animal colony. And that was a unit on the top floor of this three-story building headed by a man by the name of Dr. Edmund Farris. He ran the, I believe, the only artificial, the only, yes, um, artificial insemination unit in the United States, mm -hmm. where he had the, uh, he, he made the, dis he, he had the major advantage of uh, ha having available to him the Wistar rats, which meant that he could use the virgin female rats to conduct the Ashheim Zondek test, which is a test in which, in the case of humans, a woman's uh, morning urine inoculated into the ovaries of a virgin female rat would, if she was uh, ovulating, 
show, uh, show that presence by enlargement of the veins that ran around the ovaries of the virgin female rat. And so, of a woman, and then using sperm don donors could uh, uh, result in significant successes in pregnancies. And I remember several women at that time who were walking up the interior step, steps at the Wistar Institute with a big smile on their face, carrying a, a young baby and going in to thank Ed Farris for the work that he had done. Ed got in a lot of trouble because he also was expert in research on, on sperm, on male sperm. And he discovered that many men and uh, many of those who did not father the infants uh, that I just described, but who were married to those women, of course, that they suffered from impaired sperm, either motility problems or configuration problems. And he voiced the then unique opinion that contrary to the universal belief of all physicians in, at that time, it was possible that that a sterile, uh, uh, that, that a, a marriage that result, result in, resulted in, in no, no uh, children was in fact the result of men and not women, which was mm -hmm. universally believed. And that got him in big trouble with mm -hmm. the medical establishment, not only because of his discovery, but because he was a PhD and not an MP. And so, and this is all a matter of public record. I can give reference to this information. But he, he finally, his, his institution finally uh, folded because some enterprising newspaper reporters got a hold of this unique uh, story about it, this institute. And uh, it went it traveled to the ears of some religious leaders in Philadelphia mm -hmm. who also uh, leaned on the on Ed Farris to close his facility. Very sad story because the women who, and men who benefited from that insemination uh, center uh, were uh, had their lives changed in a very happy way to have children of their own, which they otherwise couldn't have. Um, it was, uh, getting back, that, that was an aside from my uh, hire, uh, hiring uh, as a cell cultures by Hillary Kapraski at Wistar. And I uh, was hired to run a tissue culture laboratory at Wistar, at Wistar to serve the needs of the then senior members of the Institute. The senior members, unlike me, were Hillary's uh, scientific associates at, uh, I believe it was Letterly Laboratories. Mm -hmm. And um, they were brought there from Letterly. And uh, Hillary was, uh, uh, putting them in the highest positions. When he hired me, I was not a senior member of the Institute. And I was hired more uh, to run this service laboratory, but I knew what he must have known, but didn't voice it. And that is that as the director of a, that service laboratory, I would have after hopefully being successful in running it, which I was able to do in less than a year, I would then have free time to conduct my own research in cell culture, which I intended to do, without the burden of grant applications. Because I, the materials that I wanted to use in the research that I was interested in it was available to me in this service lab, uh, mostly materials that would otherwise be discarded. 
So um, that was a huge plus. And I undertook uh, a re research program, uh, which was as follows. Do you want me to continue? I think you had another question. No, I, um, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to go into the, the Hayflick limit and uh, sort of the, you know, about you... To, I'm about to describe that, but please, you said something earlier about Philadelphia during the Depression. No, no, this was this is great because I, I, I love how you've gone from the Depression into, you know, post-World War II and, and sort of the... Um, the amazing amount of things that we, wait, we read about in the history books, but that were happening down the street here. And I, I mean, obviously you and I are both Philly boys growing, growing up, but um, you know take what? us. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. We no, it's, good. Uh, so, so I'll continue. Please. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, I was interested in, at that time when I, uh, started this new lab and I should say parenthetically that Hillary raised an enormous sum of money to renovate the Wistar Institute laboratories which were from the 19th century and uh, I, I as all the people there ended up with beautiful new labs and I had a large cell culture laboratory with what we call uh, sterile rooms which are uh, two or three rooms at either end of the large laboratory that were uh, filtered through, had air filtered through HEPA filters, which means that they, that they held back uh, viruses and bacteria and other larger entities. And uh, so I had a very good laboratory. Uh, so the research project that I decided to do within less than a year of establishing the service lab was to take advantage of the knowledge that existed then, or new knowledge, that some animals, mainly, mainly rodents, were found to have uh, cancers produced by viruses. That was not entirely new because Peyton Rouse, a well-known name, at least in those days, who ultimately became part of my professional life that I'll mention later, that Peyton Rouse discovered the viral etiology of um, a tumor uh, of, of cancers, a particular kind of cancers in chickens. In any case, uh, that fascinated me and I decided to do a very simple-minded experiment I decided to, to grow human tumor tissue, cancer tissue that I could obtain from across the street at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. And I would grow the, I plan to grow the, those tumor tissues. And then by the method, the extraction methods that were then known to be successful in isolating uh, oncogenic or cancer-causing viruses uh, for rodent laboratory animals or rodents in particular, that I would adapt those extraction methods on the human-grown cancer cells and expose the extracts to normal human cells in culture to see whether I could convert them, the technical term is transform them, into cancer cells. That was a simple-minded experiment. Well, it was very easy through my association with, with, with Isidore Rabden at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, a very well-known surgeon and the medical leader at the hospital at that time. I got to know him through Hillary, the director of the, Institute, uh, the Wister Institute, and um, uh, he was able to arrange for me to get tumor tissue. The next, uh, which was relatively simple. The next problem was to get uh, a normal human tissue, which is not easily surrendered by people who are well. Uh, but I uh, learned by this time of a serious problem 
that could uh, lie within the cells obtained from human adults. And that is often they would contain uh, ordinary viruses like maybe that were hiding there, like even rubella or measles or uh, many other viruses that I won't go into details now that would, if present in the adult human cells that I thought I would use, would confound my work because I was looking for a, a cancer virus. Uh, it was also known that human fetal the cells were clean of these unwanted contaminating viruses. And so I focused on trying to obtain human fetal tissue, which was not, uh, uh, not easy. Uh, finally, with proper connections, again at the, at the hospital at Penn, I decided to, um, I, I arranged to get uh, fetuses that were surgically aborted or spontaneously aborted at Penn. And that was the source of the fetal cells, mostly derived from human fetal lung that I, I, I intended to use to apply the extracts upon derived from the human tumor tissue. So I began to grow the normal human fetal lung cells. And uh, obviously, the availability of the fetal fetuses uh, was random. I would get a phone call, sadly, and usually Friday at 5 p.m., that a human fetus was available. I should come over and get it. And that, that event occurred at random times, of course, it could be planned. And I would set cultures of fibroblasts from the lungs of each of those uh, fetuses. And after having, let's say, a dozen of them, one day I walked into the incubator room. Next to my laboratory was a large room, temperature kept at 37 degrees Celsius, or about 98 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which, of course, as one might ex expect, would be the ideal temperature to grow human cells and other cells as well. So I walked and I had a shelf assigned to me on which my cultures were kept and others had other shelf assignments. Uh, I walked and I had the habit of going in to look at my cultures every day or two. And one day I walked in and saw one culture that was uh, uh, seemed to have stopped dividing. Mm. And uh, that was no surprise because at that time, people were well aware of the difficulties of cell, of culturing cells and the common observance of failure. And I thought, well, this one has fail is failing for some reason. I don't know what it is, but I'll just accept it. A couple of days later, a week later, I find another culture showing the same phenomenon. That is cessation of mitotic activity, the cessation of division capacity. And I, uh, I got a little more interested in this. I couldn't understand what was going on, but it still didn't trigger, trigger my curiosity sufficiently until Again, for the third and the fourth time, I saw these luxuriantly growing cultures stop dividing. Looked at my laboratory notebook and made the discovery that the ones that had stopped dividing were the cultures that were set, that were in culture longest. In other words, the fetuses were received 10 or 11 months ago, while the ones received within the last month or two were growing luxuriantly in the same pool of media, same group of glassware, and cultured by the same technician. So the likelihood of some artifact uh, emerging was uh, remote. And this triggered my curiosity. It wasn't a eureka moment. It was uh, 
gee, that's funny, mom. So I uh, became so much interested in that phenomenon and what was causing it that I abandoned the original research on human cancer viruses that I described. And I uh, decided to do an experiment that would hopefully uh, dispose of the beliefs that were widespread at that time when cultures failed, that my cultures failed for some artifact, some artifact like a virus or bacterial contamination or media uh, errors and media formulation, all of those uh, 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 those excuses were invoked by people whose cultures failed. Fortunately, my colleague, Paul Moorhead, who I brought actually uh, had, had arranged to, to be hired by Hillary from Pomerat's lab where we met, uh, Paul Moorhead was a cytogeneticist. And at that time, it was just discovered, believe it or not, that humans had uh, uh, 46 uh, chromosomes and not 42, as was believed. I believe I got that right because I grew up knowing uh, one set of chromosomes and then, then had to adapt to the new discovery. In any case, the, the more important fact is that you could distinguish, Paul could distinguish with techniques available at that time between male and female cells because female cells had an inactive X of the two X's. And that inactive X could be stained during interphase. That is during the time that the cells were not in a state of division, which was most of the time. And with that marker, I did the following experiment. I, the, the discovery that was earlier made was that the fetal cells could undergo between 40 and 60 population doublings before they stopped dividing. That was the that's funny moment story. So I took female cells, which we could identify, of course, uh, at the, let's say, 20th population doubling out of 50, and mix them with an equal number of male cells, let's say it's a 40th doubling, and keep unmixed controls going side by side, and keep the mixture going, of course, subcultivating sub them every three or four days, which would represent one or two population doublings. And then I found that the male cult, the male control culture showed the phenomenon that I described in which the male uh, control culture showed the cells stop dividing. So I looked at the mixture and found only female cells uh, because the female cells had overgrown the male cells and they just disappeared in subsequent subcultivations. And the female control culture was still growing luxuriantly. Well, that proved rather significantly that whatever could be invoked as the cause of the cessation of division in normal human cells, fetal cells after 40 to 60 doublings, had to know how to distinguish between male and female cells. Because if it was an artifact of culture or media construction, then that would have to play a role only in the male cells and not in the female cells, which continued to luxuriate. Uh, and that was pretty conclusive evidence that, th that this phenomenon that I discovered was an intracellular phenomenon that had nothing to do with extracellular events like bad media, bad culturing techniques, phases of the moon, or anything that people invoked up until that time.
So uh, uh, I called it the dirty old man experiment because we mixed young female cells with old male cells. <laughs> but I can sure, assure you that the dirty old lady experiment gave the same results. Um, so I decided that we should publish this work. And the main uh, concern uh, of several, but one of the main concerns was to be sure that this wasn't an artifact because as word leaked out about my results and my interpretation after excluding everything else that I could think of, my interpretation was that this was aging or senescence at the cellular level which was simply a kind of wastebasket where I threw something into that I otherwise could not explain. Uh, so that's where the association of my discovery with aging or senescence at the cellular level came about. Um, the, I was also very concerned about this discovery because it violated a, a uh, dogma that had existed for 60 years at the birth of cell culture, the early part of the 20th century. And that was, uh, that, was that uh, all of my, superior, my, my superiors, uh, leaders in the field and others, believe, everybody else in the field believed that uh, all cells in culture are immortal. Regardless of their source, they have the potential for immortality, so I must have made a mistake. Well, this was of such concern that I decided to send cultures of my, uh, one of my cell strains to several of the leaders in the field, uh, Harry Eagle, who I knew, George Guy, the discoverer of the HeLa cells, actually it was his wife, who I also knew, mm -hmm. and several other well-known characters in the field. And I said, I'm sending you these cultures. Do me the favor of culturing them because I can tell you that although it's not, we're now in the month of June, that in the month of December or November, these cultures will fail regardless of your superior culture, uh, culturing capabilities. Well, they poo-pooed that idea. And sure enough, the phone rang in November and December from Harry and from George saying that the cell cultures that I sent to them had, had stopped dividing. So I felt relieved, uh, believing that if I went down in flames, I would have some significant personality going down in flames along with me. And I decided to publish wrote the paper and the paper included a number of other things It included the virus spectrum of the cells, which is, was very significant as it later turned out because uh, I discovered that these uh, human cells were uh, particularly s uh, sensitive to, to the growth and isolation of human viruses. And I listed in this first paper all of the viruses that I could grow in these cells, which meant all of the then known human viruses, and uh, the several other aspects of their, of their um, culture characteristics. So the paper I decided to send to a, the Cadillac of journals at that time, which was called the Journal of Experimental Medicine, okay. published from the Rockefeller Institute at that time, committee at that time, and for several other reasons. Another reason I, won, I sent the paper there was because it was the place where Alexis Carell published his work, yep. a famous scientist in the mid 20th century who claimed that he could culture chick heart cells up to 43 years nonstop. Mm. And uh, he interpreted that to support the general dogma that cells and culture had the potential to be immortal regardless of their origin. Well, that was a that 
I decided uh, later uh, from a series of incidents that I won't discuss now unless I'm asked to. Uh, I uh, had reason to believe that Carell's work was, was wrong, that the methods of culturing that he used in which the nutrient material for his allegedly immortal cell population was actually contaminated periodically with chick cells from the chick embryo, uh, embryo material that he used to feed this so-called immortal population. Yeah. So he was, he was introducing new fibroblasts, chick fibroblasts, periodically into this alleged immortal cell population, which incidentally gained international notice in newspapers worldwide who came to Carell's lab, he was one of the first scientists to realize the value of public notoriety. Mm. And in his new lab, he built a, um, a balcony for reporters to look down at his, uh, himself and his, his technicians, all of whom were gowned in black from head to toe and in a room painted on all sides, ceiling and floor in black because of Alexis Carell's belief as a surgeon that that would reduce the uh, likelihood of contamination, which was a serious problem in cell culture in those days. And that lent an air of mysticism around this field of cell culture that even to this day has a remnants. But um, Carell retained, uh, obtained international recognition for the so-called immortal population. Uh, each January, reporters would arrive in his lab to celebrate its anniversary. One uh, newspaper, the uh, New York, um, I forget the name of the paper that's now defunct, but it had a headline one year that said, Dr. Carell's immortal cell cultures, if the, all of the cells were kept and not, and not removed because you couldn't keep all of them if they doubled every two or three days, if you kept all of the cells that Dr. Carell grew, the headline in the newspaper read, it would create a rooster that could cross the Atlantic Ocean in a single stride. <laughs> Anyhow, my, my beliefs were later, later confirmed that either Carell knew about this error or did not. And there are published papers uh, tr proving, trying to prove at least, that he knew about this, but became so famous because of it, he couldn't reveal the truth. Any, in any case, getting back to the second reason why I chose the Journal of Experimental Medicine to publish my work is because of a major personality uh, alive in the field at that time, Carell had since died. Um, and this gentleman, uh, whose name escapes me at the moment, but uh, I will recall it momentarily. Uh, he had also been working with normal human cells and published his work in, in this journal, but never saw the phenomenon that I did. I won't go into the details now, but I will subsequently if required. Uh, so bec for those two reasons, I sent the paper to this journal and um, after several months, the re it was rejected with a letter claiming, first of all, and I think I can quote the letter uh, verbatim, the letter said, if there is any uh, truth to come out of cell culture, it's that a culture provided with the proper media has the capacity to replicate indefinitely. 
And secondly, he, he wrote, the suggestion that this, you can interpret this work to have anything to do with aging is, quote, notably rash, end quote. The letter was signed by Peyton Rouse, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, who was well known for his discovery of the viral etiology of of chicken uh, pathology, and who six months later after signing that letter won the Nobel Prize, uh, meant that I uh, was very depressed. And at the suggestion of Hilary Kaprowski, my boss, uh, the letter, the paper written by myself and Paul Moorhead was sent to Sweden to the journal called Experimental Cell Research. And that paper was published without any changes almost immediately (laughs) and has now been cited 7,000 times, which if uh, for those scientists who are viewing this will know is pretty much a record that's rarely been exceeded. The second paper that I wrote on the subject in which I found that cells from human adults went through fewer replications and cells from uh, from uh, younger adults. Uh, That paper uh, has, I think, up to today about five to 6,000 citations. And uh, these two papers were uh, assigned to be uh, citation classics in the Institute for Scientific Information, then uh, located in Philadelphia and uh, headed by Eugene Garfield, now unfortunately deceased. Um, so the paper was, was, was very successful, although I should say that it took at least 10 years for the, the general cell culture and biological community to accept what I had discovered. I also became interested after having proven at least to myself that there was an intracellular counting mechanism, decided to do experiments to find more, find out more about this, this mysterious intracellular counting mechanism, which manifested itself in a most unusual way. That is, if the cell cultures that had a 50 doubling potential were frozen at any population doubling from one to 50, and then reconstituted months or years later, even to this day, uh, 58 years later, they remember what doubling level they were when frozen and replicated beyond that number to 50 after reconstitution. So the cells had this remarkable capacity of memory without a brain. So there must be a counting mechanism. In pursuit of that goal, uh, Dr. Woodring Wright, a a former student of mine and I discovered that this counting mechanism was in the nucleus of the cell, of normal cells. I also discovered and reported in that paper another important finding, and that is that because I knew that normal cells had a finite capacity to replicate, I also realized that the only cells that had a capacity for immortality, that is unlimited replicative capacity, were Mm -hmm. cancer or tumor uh, cancer cells. And that gave birth to the new field (coughs) of um, of uh, cell immortalization, where cancer researchers are looking for the reasons at the molecular level w- why cells, uh, normal cells, become cancer cells and obtain this capacity of immortality. 
in, in closing this aspect of the story, I should mention that the molecular uh, base, the molecular uh, uh, explanation for my phenomenological discoveries was made about 10 years after my discoveries by Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider and Shostak, although he was not directly involved, the two ladies were, mm -hmm. who discovered that uh, after an accidental meeting of, uh, that Carol Greider had with one of my scientific grandchildren, Cal Harley, at, the, at McMaster University in Canada, she visited her husband, her boyfriend at that time there, met Cal Harley, my you know, student, or at least in theory, and um, they both discussed each other's work and decided to do a critical experiment. I won't go into the details of why they decided to do this, but each didn't know the other's work. Cal Harley worked with my system of uh, limited replicative capacity normal cells. And he and Carol decided to do a key experiment in which she had the knowledge of telomere attrition. And they discovered in a famous paper, soon to be published, or then later published in Science, that the telomeres in, the, in my cultured cells uh, reduced in length at each doubling and reached a point that uh, sent a downstream method, a message to the DNA to stop cell replication. And uh, Liz Blackburn later discovered the enzyme telomerase, mm -hmm. which now explained my discovery of why cancer cells are immortal. That is, the uh, normal cells uh, which, uh, from which they emerged express the enzyme telomerase, which lays on the uh, parts of the telomeres that are removed at each doubling in normal cells. And by replacing the lost ones, telomerase provides the cell with the property of immortality. So that comes pretty much to a point of closure, but I should mention one other thing since you mentioned my role in the field of mycoplasmology, that about the same year that I made this discovery of um, finite lifetime of culture of normal cells, uh, I was also working with, still working with the mycoplasmas. Mm -hmm. In fact, I got a strong memo from Hilary Kaprowski, a copy of which I still have, and which Hilary <laughs> said, hey Flick, you were hired to run a cell culture laboratory and not, <laughs> and not to continue your work with the mycoplasmas. Please cease and desist. Well, those who know my personality know that I do not accept authority with great pleasure and continued my work until Bob Chanick arrived in my laboratory. He knew Hillary Kaprowski and uh, wanted Hillary to have me provide Bob with a culture of my hum normal human cells, which were no, which are so by that time well known for their ability to culture viruses. And Bob Chanick was working on an alleged virus disease of humans called primary atypical pneumonia, better known to most people as walking pneumonia. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it was, I read recently some leading politician in this country recently was bedridden with walking pneumonia after suffering from it for some weeks. In any case, um, Bob and I got uh, chatting while I was having a technician arrange a culture to be packaged for him to take back 
the NIH where he worked. <clears throat> and Bob said, I asked him what he's working on. He said, I'm working with something called the Eaton agent, which is supposedly the cause of primary atypical pneumonia, pneumonia, but it's never been isolated as a virus, despite the fact that, it, that it's carried in embryonated chicken eggs, the only way that you could, they could, it could be cultured. The person associated with the agent at that time was a man by the name of Monroe Eaton, who worked at Harvard University. And what neither of them knew, and what I knew when Bob related the story to me, was that many uh, ordinary animals suffer from, a, from pneumonia caused by a mycoplasma. And I said to Bob, have you ever looked at this agent, allegedly but never proven to be a virus, to be a PPLO, which is what they were called at that time. He said, what are PPLOs? So I gave him a one, course 101 in PPLOology and uh, asked him to send me a culture of this so-called Eaton agent. He sent me the material. I isolated an organism quickly a mycoplasma on a media that I, I had then just developed uh, because I had no faith in the then existing culture media. And uh, later, Bob, I told Bob what I had found. And he was stunned. He sent people from his lab to my lab at Wistar to train and how to culture these organisms. And we then published a paper uh, because using Koch's postulates, we proved that the agent I discovered when instilled into the nasal cavities of prisoner volunteers at the clinical center at NIH produced the disease mm -hmm. called walking pneumonia. Yep. The paper was written and uh, it was this, uh, received so well received it received a column uh, uh, on the top fold of the sunday front page of the new york times mentioning my name and bob's of course uh, along with wistar institute which was a big boost for the wistar institute to appear on the front page of the new york times and on the Monday morning, my lab door opened, and there is my boss, Hillary Kapraski, standing there with an outstretched hand, wanting to shake mine and congratulating me on my discovery. So that's why I still like to have and show people the memorandum that he wrote for me to cease and desist. A, a fascinating uh, journey, to say the least. Uh, not only do you lay the ground for modern cancer and mortalization research, you, you anger <laughs> Alexis Carell and Hillary Kaprowski, and uh, and also uh, you, know, you, you set the stage for something that's happening right now as well in terms of this uh, new sort of pharmacotherapeutic field uh, of, of senolytics where a lot of... Yeah, exactly. You know, well, you're right, of course. I had no expectation of that happening in my lifetime, but it certainly has. I also should say that I made... I mean, I'm not bragging. I'm just stating facts. Please. I, I discovered two other important things. First of all, in the early days of cell culture, the cells are grown on petri, in petri dishes or something called corel flasks, and they're very, diff very difficult to use the then existing microscopes to see the cells because you would need a long working distance lens, mm. which, were, which either didn't exist or were very rare to obtain. And in my effort to solve that problem, I discovered that there was an inverted microscope used by uh, crystallographers. I obtained one of these microscopes from a, a salesman from, um, I'm trying 
can think of the name of the microscope company, a major microscope company. And he said, well, I'll, he, he, he said, I'll send you one of these crystallographer microscopes. I said, well, don't do that yet. I said, have your people uh, convert it in the following way. And I gave him instructions on how, how I would like to have it made. They made it. And I then received the first inverted microscope, which was perfect to view cultures by having the, uh, the, the object, objective under the stage. And that microscope became the granddaddy of all current inverted microscopes used in cell culture labs throughout the world. It was accessioned by the, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, along with um, packages of uh, vaccines produced in one of my cell strains called WI38, uh, a cell strain that I worked with uh, a normal cell culture at, with a finite lifetime mm -hmm. that I worked with for many years and that I failed to mention became the subject of a very important discovery. And that was its use for the manufacture of human virus vaccines. I listened to the, um, to the uh, discussion that uh, Stanley Klot Klotkin had, but he did not mention in his discovery of the rubella vaccine the enabling technology. The enabling technology was my gifting to him mm. and to Hilary Kaprowski, who produced a the best, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, rabies vaccine, which is still in existence, superior mm -hmm. to anything ever made, that, the, that they were both successful because of my gift to them of WI-38. Yeah. It had two major successes in respect to the rubella vaccine that, uh, that uh, Stanley is given credit for. The passage of the rubella virus that he was working with in WI-38 gave to that virus the property of uh, attenuation. That is, the virus retained its antigenic capabilities, that is to produce antibodies in a vac vaccinated person, but did not retain its, its capacity to produce the disease, mm. that is the pathogenicity. Uh, that was key to his discovery that that rubella virus, for which he claims credit, was then capable of being used in the vaccine that was superior to the one that he was competing with, produced by the then called Division of Biologic Standards, which subsequently became as a result of my congressional testimony, to some extent, moved to the FDA, they were producing a vaccine against the rubella virus produced in primary monkey kidney, yep. which was known to have unacceptable side effects, at least subsequently. But because the DBS, when it came to make a decision between the RE27-3 virus vaccine of that, that Stanley made with using my WI38 cells, in which it's produced even to this day, uh, that the DBS became a judge and jury as to which vaccine would be accepted first. And because they were, uh, they had the choice between their own developed vaccine and Stanley's, um, they chose obviously their own. And when that became produced by Merck, it showed unacceptable side effects. Merck abandoned it 
embraced the vaccine that Stanley made in WI38, and that became a monopoly even in the entire Western Hemisphere about which, uh, from which Merck has made billions of dollars. I should also mention something very important. Please. And that is that I distributed WI38 for free to every qualified uh, vaccine manufacturer in the world who asked for it, and virtually all of them did, and to every researcher who asked for it, until it became apparent that I could not afford the cost of sending hundreds of cultures to colleagues all over the world, which would run into the thousands of dollars, which I certainly didn't have. And uh, as a result of that, I charged uh, people a nominal fee for the cost of packaging and mailing the cultures to, to uh, recipients. The costs were exactly those charged by the, the American Type Culture C Collection, a quasi-governmental organization, mm -hmm. that, o that I also had given ampules of WI-38 to very early mm -hmm. on. So the cost ranged from $15 to $75 over a period of 15 or 20 years. All of those monies were put into a special bank account to decide who owned those funds because this was a unique situation in biology. It had never been determined who owned a self-replicating system like WI-38. Sure. And uh, without going into all of the details, one of the, only one of which I'll mention, and that is that as a result of my testimony before a Senate uh, investigating uh, committee, uh, headed by Abraham Ribicoff, um, I testified that DBS, who I mentioned earlier as judge and jury for the Bella vaccine, made it with Star, uh, should not be in the business of being judge and jury because of obvious conflict of interest problems. Mm -hmm. And that they, they, they should be moved from the NIH where they were then located uh, to the obvious organization, and that's the FDA. Mm -hmm. Having it moved to the FDA was accepted by Congress, who then did exactly that. But it made the members of the DBS at NIH angry with me because it turned them from NIH scientists to what they would then be labeled as FDA controllers, mm -hmm. which they felt was a step down. It certainly practically was not. Um, that aggravated, I th it was one of the compelling reasons why when I became a candidate for the first director of the National Institute on Aging and asked the then incoming, new incoming director at that time, uh, I asked them to settle a very important matter, or two important matters. First, the title to WI-38, which was in contention, and second, the disposition of the funds that I had kept in the bank account all those years uh, as to who was entitled to those funds. Um, I asked the leadership of the NIH to send to me their most brilliant lawyer because the issue of title to a self-duplicating system was never addressed in law. And instead of that, they sent to me an accountant <laughs> whose knowledge of cell culture and the law was encyclopedic. This um, about to retire accountant 
saw an opportunity to crown his dull career by uh, unseating a, a known scientist, namely me, by accusing me of theft of government property and charging a sum of money for personal gain by selling that property. Well, that immediately caused me to file suit against this, against the people who were making this charge at, at, at NIH, FDA, and uh, DHEW at that time. And uh, uh, in addition to that, they, the government felt so compelled after 10 years of resisting the use of WI-38 for vaccine production in this country, and then, and then becoming so enamored of it as a result of WI-38 successful use in most European countries, decided to confiscate WI-38 from my liquid nitrogen tanks at Stanford University, where mm -hmm. I was at the time, and remove them all to Washington and claim them for themselves. So I immediately brought suit against those three federal entities, claiming that there were four stakeholders in cells like these. First of all, the estate of the fetus from which this tissue came. The second stakeholder was the institution where the work was done. The third stakeholder would be any entity that funded the research that I did and the government did not. All of the work that I've described in this interview was done without a NIH grant or contract. It was bootlegged and the results of my work uh, cannot be attributed to any grant or contract other than an overhead grant to the Wistar Institute in its entirety mm -hmm. made by the NCI in the early 60s. I was not a PI on that, principal investigator. It was Hillary, mm -hmm. and it only paid for the lights and the heat and the janitorial services from my lab and all the other labs at the Institute. In any case, my lawsuit was ultimately won by me in an out-of-court settlement after the occurrence of three significant events. The first event was the ruling called the Chakrabarty decision uh, made by the Supreme Court that it was in 1970. 77, I think, or 76, that living entities could be patented. Up until that time, you could not patent living things. So I could never patent WI-38. I had to give it away free, which is what I did, except for charging, as I explained, for the cost of mailing culture. The uh, second major uh, so, so I, the uh, statute of limitations had expired, so I cannot patent WI-38. Uh, Hillary and, um, and Stanley Lake Potkin both patented the process for producing the rabies vaccine and Stanley's rubella vaccine uh, with the, without consulting me. And in the first paragraph of each patent saying, that the enabling technology was the availability of WI-38. The Wistar Institute has received $30 million a year from licensing the technologies that I described for these vaccines. Hillary Kapraski and Stanley, I am told by Stanley himself, receive remuneration for those vaccine development. Paul Moorhead and I have received zero. Um, okay, so um, I'm now wanting to 
uh, finish this story about the lawsuit. The third thing that happened with this lawsuit that drove the government to uh, ask for an out-of-court settlement because they found themselves in an impossible position was that the NIH itself and most major universities in this country began to realize what monies they could make by licensing the research performed by their faculty members. And so they established in these universities separate entities consisting of lawyers, patent attorney experts, to do what I just described. Yep. It was unheard of when I was a student. If you had anything to do with money, when you were, uh, when I was at Penn, you would be considered uh, a failure. And it was totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. You did research to benefit people and not to benefit your pocketbook. And that was completely overturned in the, in the 70s, 80s, and up until this date. The, um, the other the final major thing that happened was that NIH itself held science fairs, they still do annually, mm -hmm. to advertise the research work of NIH employees uh, for the sale of, the, of what discoveries are made in NIH to commercial organizations. I mean, that was unheard of for decades. If, if the NIH did it, if anybody at the NIH did that in the earlier years, they would be imprisoned because you're using the taxpayers' money to enrich not only the Institute, but the individual scientists who later were and still are to this day could become enriched by discoveries they make at the NIH to get commercially exploited. Uh, so the whole community of science uh, has been overturned uh, in, in ways that emphasize the commercial aspects uh, that were never emphasized in the early years of my career. Um, it's questionable, of course, whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I think it probably is a good thing, but it, only because it, it is hopefully not only enriching the entrepreneurs, but also the scientists who made the original discoveries mm -hmm. and who took those discoveries from their laboratories, supported by, ta by taxpayers' money, and founded Genentech and Amgen and uh, many other well-known biotechnology companies with materials that they isolated in their taxpayer-supported laboratories and used to found these other companies. That also became a major issue during my uh, lawsuit because the originators of those companies that I mentioned uh, uh, were uh, uh, willing to file and asked to file amicus briefs in support of my position. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would not have been able to start those companies. And it was later decided by, by Ronald Reagan through executive order that anything discovered using taxpayers' money in research institutions could be exploited commercially. Mm -hmm. That was later incorporated in federal legislation. So it became a commonplace thing to do in subsequent years. Fascinating, really fascinating. I should also mention that the vaccine, this is my final statement. Go for it. Well, two final statements. The other one is that the, I, I also found in addition to that microscope, a way of producing powdered media for growing cell cultures, which is a huge industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry today. And that discovery was uh, described in Nature Magazine, give it away freely to companies mm. who, as I've indicated, established a billion dollar industry 
of powdered media used in cell culture worldwide. Um, the final thing that I'll say is that the vaccines produced in WI38 worldwide consist of vaccines against every common human virus disease. I won't list all of them, including some that are not so common, like the adenovirus, mm -hmm. um, hepatitis A, and all of the other ones that most uh, viewers will be familiar with. Sure. Those vaccines produced in WI38 have benefited at least 2 billion people worldwide, has saved 428 million lives in this country alone, and that's all been documented uh, in the scientific literature. I have never received, the only thing I've ever received in payment from a vaccine manufacturer was one time Pfizer, who produced Diplovax, the sure. polio vaccine produced in WI-38. Uh, Pfizer, a couple of leaders at Pfizer Labs with whom I had interacted as a consultant, uh, took my wife and I to a nice dinner in New York. Thank you, Pfizer. Yeah, that was a good dinner. <laughs> it wasn't two billion dollars worth. Yeah. Well, let's let's go uh, let's go forward then to um, what a lot of people feel is going to be more than a few billion dollars, and that is this um, evolving space of, of longevity. Uh, biotechnology. Um, you know, you wrote this a paper quite recently. Um, the greatest risk factor for the leading cause of death is ignored. It's in biogerontology, uh, the, the journal biogerontology. Uh, you you talk about a lot of themes that I've seen you lecture on uh, in terms of uh, sort of your definitions of aging and and, and longevity and, and sort of the the connection between one sort of catabolic process of aging and one anabolic uh, genome-driven project uh, process of longevity. Um, and then obviously this uh, interest in focusing in the future on longevity determinants and, and, and sort of this may view within the cells that changes over time, the, the, the physics that are happening within the cells of the different energetic states of the biomolecules. Uh, take us out a bit, if you would, to um, the next part of your career in solving or, or, or dealing with this issue of, of death, which we, you know, I, we lose 65 million or so people a year due to death. Uh, and it's all driven for the most part by aging. Of course, people do get hit by cars and struck by lightning, but uh, a large chunk of that are these age related diseases. Um, where's Len Hayflick taking us uh, into the future? Where, where do you see the potential? Uh, based on what you outline in this recent paper as uh, as where you're going to take the industry now? <clears throat> well, first of all, I don't believe that there is any reasonable likelihood, that is, that the probabilities are as close to zero as you can get, mm -hmm. that anyone will find a way to interfere with the fundamental process of aging, an effort that the human, the human civilization has tried to do since recorded history 3,500 years ago. Sure. I won't go into all of the efforts. Many of them by today's scientific standards were crazy ideas. So let's not consider any of them. None of them obviously have ever been successful. I don't believe that it is possible to intervene with the process of aging because it is a universal property of all matter, including uh, all matter in the universe, living or, or non-living. The underlying reason is the second law of thermodynamics. That is that energy tends to dissipate or spread out unless it's constrained. 
the constraining in living material are chemical bonds. So that um, if you believe that, and I happen to believe it along with many other people now, uh, the likelihood of intervening in a law of physics and violating that law is very, very unlikely. What is more likely and more and perhaps uh, uh, equally beneficial is to s discover why diseases are, as you properly stated, that is, the leading causes of death, are age associated. If they're age associated, then why aren't we doing research on the etiology of aging in biological material? And that's the basis for the paper that you described. There is no institution in this country or abroad with the word aging in their title that is supporting any research on trying to understand the etiology of aging in biological material. Now, putting aside the likelihood of actually intervening in the process, which I, as I've indicated, seems to me to be terribly unlikely, the plus side of it is that if we can understand the molecular landscape of young cells as distinguished from the molecular landscape of old cells or cells at the end of a lineage of cells, then that would, could reveal why old cells are more vulnerable to pathology than are young cells. That doesn't take much of a leap of intellect to appreciate. And it could also explain what everybody says, and that is that these pathologies are age associated. That is, there must be something about the mole molecular arrangements in old cells that increase their vulnerability to pathology. And that landscape determination is doable. We have the technology today, I won't go into all of the technology because I can't recite it from memory, but it's in the public uh, scientific literature, but there are methods for understanding the shape of molecules, of uh, molecules that have to do with life, that is biomolecules, their size, their structure, their appearance, how they move because they're in constant motion, uh, so that that technology exists to do just as I said. And that's where the research should lie. The other interesting phenomenon about the startup companies that you mentioned, and of course there are hundreds of them, uh, and following them, I've, I've learned the, fo the following. They all start out with the belief that we've reached a, a level of scientific understanding today that will permit us to uh, interfere with the fundamental process of aging. Well, that belief has been held for centuries by scientists or others uh, in former centuries for the same reason. They believed that at that time, the level of understanding of, of life was such that they could find a way to interfere with the process of aging. So we have that phenomenon existing up until this day. People argue that, well, that was also said about uh, landing somebody on the moon, but that has happened. Well, that's correct, but the principles of physics on how to get to the moon and the mathematics were, were known. We don't understand the physics and the mathematics of the landscape of molecules in old cells to be able to, to, to make that claim today. But what has happened is that as 
startup companies claiming to uh, wanting to interfere with the aging process, including Calico, by the way, for whom I uh, was asked to address their senior leadership several years ago about this question, because they started out uh, wanting to do the same thing. All of them, after discovering the relative or, or the close to impossibility of tampering with the fundamental aging process, then migrate to the to conducting research on age associated diseases. And if you look at all of those companies that have matured enough, like Calico and many others, you'll find that their basic interest today is in uh, age associated diseases. Which, put, which puts them in competition with big pharma. So good luck for the little startups in respect to competing with big pharma. Um, this is a, is a very serious problem. Uh, this lack of, of uh, realization on the part of, of uh, organizations with the word aging in their titles, with their lack of interest, despite the fact that they're, all of their leaders say to a person that the greatest risk factor for the National, for the national Cancer Institute, National Institute of Heart and Lung Disease, for the American Cancer Society, for the Heart Association, or Alzheimer's Association, can go on and on and on. And I've quoted each one of the leaders saying that the greatest risk factor for the disease in which they're interested is aging. Well, it, as I've pointed out so many times, it doesn't take a great leap of intellect to ask the next question, then why aren't you conducting research on the fundamental biology of aging? And so far, the answer has been silence. What? Going, coming a little full circle, um, you know, obviously, uh, going back to the mycoplasmology uh, and your, your discovery of, of uh, walking pneumonia, uh, atypical pneumonia, and so forth, uh, there's been so much recent uh, that have come, you know, beyond that work in terms of how these mycoplasma, which are, you know, probably one of the lesser understood groups of microorganisms, have uh, pathogenicity and not only sexually transmitted diseases, but potential link to infertility, certain types of cancers. Uh, and we touched on the topic of, of the microbiome uh, on previous shows. Um, I'm just interested if, if you've uh, come across interesting pockets of research in mycoplasmology that you find are interesting, whether it have to do with uh, the diseases of aging or other pathologies that um, you know we've 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 had a hard time with for the last several decades. But maybe mycoplasma is, is something uh, a basket of uh, of targets of interest, uh, whether for uh, you know, you know, killing them or maybe ha having some microbiome benefit. Uh, anything interesting there that you've seen throughout the years? Uh, yes, the um, major uh, interest in the mycoplasmas uh, is not only from my first discovery of their association with the human disease, but subsequent findings of their probable association with urogenital tract infections in humans. And that has occupied the attention and still does occupy the attention of many labs worldwide. Uh, the mycoplasmas happen to be uh, amenable to, to, uh, to, I should say the diseases caused by, my, by mycoplasmas happen to be amenable to treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics. So that um, the failure to produce a vaccine against mycoplasma pneumoniae, for example, which is the name I gave to my discovery of the cause of 
primary atrial pneumonia. Uh, the, there were attempts to make a vaccine, but they never succeeded. I think that the uh, attempt has been abandoned because of the efficacy of some broad spectrum antibiotics uh, because, uh, the, because mycoplasma pneumoniae has evolved in many, uh, many um, situations to be resistant to some of those antibiotics, but new ones are emerging. However, the a main area of interest for decades since the discovery of these organisms in the 1800s by no card and rue is the there is that they cause an enormous number of diseases in lower animals and in particular in in uh, important domestic animals, in chickens, and in bovines, and in pigs, all of which are important economically to humans. And the diseases that they cause are, uh, reduces their marketability because they're frequently not fatal, but uh, debilitating and uh, are found to exist in many countries still in the world, but not in the United States. We have been very successful in keeping the pneumonic conditions in the animals that I mentioned out of this country. They are found mostly on the Iberian Peninsula, in Africa, in Asia, uh, the Australians and New Zealanders have been pretty successful also in keeping uh, mycoplasma cause uh, diseases from commercially important domestic animals. But it's a huge industry of prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, One more Yes. I'm Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. No, let me interrupt. Well, I, I, I was just going to say the obvious of that is that the interest, most of the interest today in the mycoplasmas uh, are, are by veterinarian, veterinary researchers. Uh, although there are certainly um, medical entities interested in, in treating mycoplasma pneumoniae, uh, respiratory disease, and also your general diseases. Len, while I have you, um, I, I can't let you go without uh, getting uh, your top line on, on COVID. Um, okay. Obviously, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're coming towards some threshold. Uh, I, I don't know when that threshold is going to be and when, when these first uh, phase three studies are going to open up and uh, we'll, we'll see what's what. But uh, can you give us any Top line, Len Hayflick, insights on uh, where you think we're going with this in terms of single shot vaccines, multiple administrations, um, WI38 involvement in producing large amounts of it for the world. Uh, where, where, give, give us some Len Hayflick uh, COVID insights, if you would, while I have you. Well, I can't <clears throat> start to give you some insights without mentioning that I was associated, associated with a group of British researchers and the discovery of one of the first uh, coronaviruses. And that was a common cold virus that uh, I discovered along with these associates. This has been published in Lancet magazine in 1963 or two. And uh, so I do have that early history of interest, but anyhow, to answer your question directly, I've been fascinated with the sad part of this whole story of COVID viruses or SARS viruses, I should say, uh, in respect to the emergence of instant virologists 
an instant epidemiologist and the nonsense that they have uh, presented to the public without any understanding of either of those fields. It, it, it simply is an example of the human condition more than it is of anything else and how people want to be expert instantaneously in areas that they have total, in which they have total ignorance. So that's one part of this whole uh, story that has been intriguing in, in, in that revelation. But as far as the practical aspects are concerned, it's, uh, it's likely that a vaccine or two or three will be developed using the new technology which has emerged since my days when I first produced vaccines against polio. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I was the first, uh, I was a senior author on a paper along with Stanley and others and Hillary uh, in which we described the production of the first polio vaccine produced in human deployed in normal human fetal cells. So I do have a uh, intimate association, not only with viruses, with which I have worked for several decades, but also with, with taking a virus from the laboratory bench to FDA licensure, which I don't think anyone today has had yet. Mm. So I know all of the all of the aspects of vaccine development pretty intimately. The uh, likelihood of producing a vaccine against COVID-19, I think is pretty good. Uh, it will not happen, at least if I, my crystal ball is accurate and based on my experience until well into next year. Uh, there is also some serious problems in respect to distribution of the vaccine. Uh, we're already faced with so-called anti-vaxxers, people who uh, will not take even current vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know of a vaccine against COVID-19 that uh, is being uh, considered to be made in WI-38 or any normal human uh, cell, uh, mainly for the reason that the modern technology where you can make vaccines uh, without using cell cultures mm. uh, to a large extent are possible. And also because of the, wide, uh, the wide belief on the part of very religious people who will not accept a vaccine produced in a cell derived from a human fetus, despite the fact that that fetus, like the WI-38 derived fetus, would have otherwise been incinerated. Uh, so the question is, is it, in the case of WI-38, is it better to lose a half a billion lives of people in order uh, not to incinerate the tissue? Very simple question. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to the COVID vaccines, there, there are two of the vaccines that are in competition today are in fact tested on cells that were derived from human from a human fetus so mm -hmm. they're all, uh, 293 cells derived from human fetal kidney and immortalized with adenovirus uh, with an adenovirus construct and that has been published and could possibly be the basis for the refusal of 
people who believe in the uh, who believe that um, that genes because they're tested using two nine three cells. Right. Uh, but I believe that there's a good likelihood that a vaccine will be made and be available toward the middle or end of next year. Uh, the other serious consideration is based on the uh, mutability of this virus. And that has been demonst clearly demonstrated that it could turn out to be something like the flu that we will have to prepare a vaccine against new antigenic properties of this vaccine on a periodic basis for years to come, as we currently do with the flu virus vaccines. That seems to me to be a real, a, a good probability, as unpleasant as it sounds, but hopefully the vaccines will be uh, effective against them. I also uh, need to comment on this concept of herd immunity. Okay. Many people now realize the stupidity of this uh, the current belief by one of uh, Trump's leading medical authorities who's running the his alleged vaccine program at the moment or virus program at the moment that herd immunity can be depended upon to solve the, this problem. It cannot, at least without a va um, unless we produce good vaccines. This gentleman is maintaining that the disease should be allowed to spread su sufficiently enough to have antibody levels raised in, let's say, 75% of our population, which would then provide the remaining 25% with immunity because the virus would not be able to escape from the 75% who would be uh, either dead or uh, kept alive as a result of their better immune systems. So uh, that notion, and it's been, th that notion of herd, immuni herd immunity has been objected to by almost all of the serious virologists who are in authority today. So um, I don't think there's much more to be said about that other than to, I think, have the basis for alleging mass murder mm. attributable to the present administration in this country for their behavior in respect to this um, COVID-19 virus uh, um, disease. Their neglect and failure to adhere to scientific principles in this field have had them, in my judgment, and I'm, I know in the judgment of other people, guilty of mass murder. I doubt that that notion is going to go anywhere, but I think it, it has to be said. It's been really a fascinating time listening to you. Um, really an honor uh, you taking this much time out of your schedule to talk about everything you've done. It's it's so inspiring and just wishing you the best with everything that you're doing now moving forward. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening on the various podcast networks or, or watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Leonard Hayflick, a uh, gentleman who has laid the groundwork for most of the major discoveries in cell biology, virus vaccine development, mycoplasmology over the last half a century. Um, 
Well, then, thank you for, for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk. Well, thank you very much, Ira. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm looking forward to the day when, after discovering that you are a fellow Philadelphian, that conditions will be such that I can visit you in Philadelphia. Absolutely. Uh, and I hope that day is sooner or late, sooner rather than later. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, Thank uh, you again. It's been a, a, a very interesting to speak with you, and especially to have the opportunity to have uh, uh, very intelligent questions asked, which is not uh, common in my experience. <laughs> Thank you for that. I appreciate that.